Yes. We are turning to Habakkuk chapter 1 and we're going to read verses 1 to 10. We're still speaking about the road to revival. And this morning we're going to look at Habakkuk the prophet here. And actually he prays a prayer here. This is a revival prayer. And I want us to have and to see and to relate. Because what Habakkuk experienced at that point in time... If I look at, at chapter 1, I can virtually almost say I am right there right now. It's like, it's this day and age. So, if you turn your Bibles there, I'm going to just read verse by verse. It begins with the burden which the prophet Habakkuk saw. The burden which he saw. And, you know, if we look sincerely around us, we often see a burden. We see a problem, we see a yoke. Something that rests upon the nation or the people. However, if we look at Habakkuk like us, he did not understand how our God works or how our God operates. And very often we look at circumstances around us and we, we do not understand. And we want to cry out to God to change a situation or a circumstance, not knowing that in that very circumstance, God is busy operating and working. In verse 2, he now comes with this lack of understanding how God operates. Habakkuk now comes in before God and he begins to petition God on behalf of the people and he begins to pray. And he says, O oh Lord, how long shall I cry and you will not hear? Now very often that sounds like some of our prayers. Very often we sit in a situation and we're thinking, how long, God, am I going to come before you? How long, God, am I going to pray about this situation? How long, God, am I going to cry out to you and it appears that you do not hear me? It appears that you do not hear me. In verse 3, he now comes and he looks and he wants to make it clear to God as if you say, you don't hear me, you don't see the situation in this country, you don't see the situation of your people. And he comes and he says, violence, iniquity, oppression, tyranny, strife, contention, and lawlessness. And he's in desperation calling out to God saying, look at it, can you see it? And you know, when I look at our country, if I look at our country today, if I look at this day and age, I see the same things. I see violence, I see iniquity. I see oppression, I see tyranny, strife, contention, and I see lawlessness prevailing throughout this country. And like a Habakkuk, we should be crying out to God as well. These are the very problems that he saw then, we are seeing right now. He continues his prayer in verse 4 and he says, The law is powerless. The law is powerless. The wicked surround the righteous and therefore perverse judgment proceeds. And so often we look in this day and age and we see that the law has become powerless. The law has not changed. The law is still the law, but the law is no longer enforced. And because it's no longer enforced by anyone, it has become powerless. It is one thing to have a rule. It is one thing to have a law or a, or a system by which we operate. But unless we enforce those laws, the law then becomes powerless. It has no effect because it's not being enforced. I mean, how many of us stand here or have stood amazed right here in this building this morning when we see murderers that are, that are being released in order to murder again? How do we see child abuse and rape? How do we see perverseness that is flourishing throughout our country? How do we see the general spirit of lawlessness that has crept into our society and is getting more and more powerful every day? 
If I did not know better, I would think Habakkuk was talking about South Africa in the year 2008. Because that's exactly where we're at. And he's praying this prayer now. How many of you are crying out with me to God and saying enough? And like a Habakkuk can say, how long, O Lord? You see, we've got to understand that God is calling you and I to take a stand before Him, crying out to Him, how long, O Lord? God wants us to intercede on behalf of a nation. He wants us to take a definite and active stance in opposition to the, the violence and the murder. In opposition to the ungodliness, to the per perverseness. In op opposition to the lawlessness that has crept into our society. It is our responsibility as Christians. We are the light of the world and the salt of the earth. We are the epistles or the letters of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are His ambassadors. We are His representatives on earth. And we are here. Second Chronicles 7.14 says, If my people who are called by my name. The onus is on us. We are the only ones that can move God. And I say that respectfully. It is only our prayers that can bring God to a point of interceding. But now God comes and He answers Habakkuk, if we drop down to verse 5 now. This is an answer to both our prayers and to His. It's wonderful to see that God actually answers the prayer before we even pray it. In verse 5 He says, I will work a work in your days which you would not believe, though it were told you. There's a time when we look and we say there is no answer, there is no solution, this is, it's a downward spiral and it's going to get worse and worse and worse and God says, in the midst of all that, I will work a work that will be so great that even if you were told, you wouldn't believe it. My God is a God that comes into the turmoil, He comes into the eternity, He comes into the strife. He comes into the contention. He comes into the lawlessness. And He brings stability. And He brings a solution. Right there. When it looks like it's darkness to us. When it looks like there is no other solution. There is no way out. God says, I will work. A work in your days. Which you would not believe. We have to understand that God is a sovereign God. In Exodus 3 verse 14. He says, I am who I am. And he's not subject to you or to me or to our ways or thoughts. He's not subject to our time. He is who he is. And he will do a work when he wants to do that work in the midst of the problem. Being sovereign means that he's under no obligation to you, Habakkuk. He's under no obligation to you and I. None of us can dictate to him when and how he will do his work. No prophet, no preacher, no church board can dictate to him when it should be done and how it should be done. And we very often look and we feel that we're, we're having no impact on society. We feel we're having no impact even upon our very own church. There are times we look and we say, it looks like it's a fruit, fruitless labor that we're busy with. But God has a promise, and the promise is that He will work a work in our midst. That even if we were told, we would not believe it. And He does that out of love and out of grace. He answers us when we cry, How long, O Lord? He did tell Abakuk what He was doing. If we go down to verses 6 to 11 now. He says, for indeed I am raising up the Chaldeans. I am raising up the Chaldeans. A bitter and hasty nation which marches through the breadth of the earth. To possess dwelling places that are not theirs. 
They are terrible and, and dreadful. Their judgment and their dignity proceeds from themselves. Verse 8. Their horses also are swifter than leopards and more fierce than evening wolves. Their chargers charge ahead. Their cavalry comes from afar. They fly as the eagle that hastens to eat. They all come for violence. Their faces are set like the east wind. They gather captives like sand. They scoff at kings and princes, are scorned by them. They deride every stronghold, for they heap up earthen mounds and seize it. Sounds like a friendly lot, this shall be. And very often God comes and He uses ungodly people to refine His people. Very often God comes and He takes the ungodly to bring us to a point of understanding, to bring us to a point of repentance, to bring us to a point of reformation as Christians. When I look at the world around me today, every onslaught is against the Christian church. You can belong to any religion as long as you're not a Christian. Every onslaught is there to attack the Word of God, God Himself, His very existence is questioned. And when we look at it, it is time. God is using this world, is using this world system to bring us back to a point of commitment, to a point of truly becoming. God's people again. If we lived out the role that God wanted us to live out, this world would not be in the state that it's in. If we lived the life, if we walked the walk instead of just talking the talk, we would have raised our children in godly ways. We would have impacted our society by what we stand for, the morals, the principles that we adhere to. Now we're coming to a point where God, like the Chaldeans, are using the ungodly to correct. Judah, right here, according to Zechariah 2 verse 8, was the apple of God's eye. And God is using this dreadful and terrible nation, the Chaldeans, to come and correct Judah. How long will God have to use the ungodly in this country to bring His church to their senses? You see, we don't understand like how could. We don't understand God's way. But God comes and He takes the very ungodly and uses the ungodly to purify the godly. Very often circumstances God has to use that circumstance to bring us back to where He wants us. Judah was shocked when Habakkuk came to him and they refused to believe Habakkuk when he made it known to them. And then he continues in Habakkuk 3 verse 2, he says, O oh Lord, revive your work in the midst of the years. In the latter part of the verse. In wrath, remember mercy. We need to say, Lord, revive your work. The church needs to be revived. We need to be revived. If you go through history and you see where the church is at today, and you see through history how there had to be reformation upon reformation upon reformation, reformation is due in this day and age. May God bring revival in the midst of this ungodly and lawless generation. At the same token, may He have mercy on His disobedient people. Our prayers, like the prayers of other books, should be highly emotional and with great fervor. It is time that passion comes back into the church. It is time that we were willing to lay down our lives for what we believe. Because like other work, we also do not understand the work and the way that God does and performs His work. 
Who can completely understand God's work? None. No one of us. If we could, we would have knowledge that spans through eternity. It's only our sovereign God that is omniscient, that is all-knowing, that knows it all. But we need to come to a point where we pray this prayer of revival. We need to cry out, when, O Lord? We need to stop living in denial and seeing the state the world is in. We need to stop living in denial and see the state the church is in. We need to stop deceiving ourselves with this mushy attitude of love. The church has got this thing of love just overrules all. There's no room for correction in the church anymore. There's no room for discipline in the church. Now that's not Christianity. That's humanitarianism. There are two different things. The church has fallen into the trap. We've fallen into the trap. Where people can just do the wrong. And we're not allowed to correct because we love. That's not love. Love includes correction. Love includes discipline. In Psalm 135 verse 6. It says, whatever the Lord pleases, He does. In heaven and in earth. In the seas and in all the deep places. And that includes hell. What He pleases, He does. But God wants a man and He wants a woman. To intercede. We can understand that God's sovereignty is free from imperfection. He is perfect. He is absolute. In 1 Chronicles 29 and 11, it says, Yours, O Lord, is the greatness, the power, and the glory, the victory, and the majesty. We need to begin to understand that that, that God is not happy, is not pleased. To accept our watered down religion that we have made Christianity. It is time for the church to come back and be fervent. It's time for the church to see where we're at and to get emotional, fervent, zealous about it. It is time for us to intercede on behalf of our people, our nation. On behalf of the unsaved, in a sincere manner. It's time that we pray this prayer that Habakkuk was praying. It is a privilege for anyone to ask God why. It's a privilege for anyone to ask God where and how He does, whatever He does. And that privilege is not yours and mine. All we have the right to do is say, How long, Lord? And that from a sincere desire to see that righteousness prevails in our country. Because God will let righteousness prevail. He will let righteousness prevail in this church. He will let it prevail in this community. But we need to be forewarned. Not to ask when, why and how. But just how long the Lord. And the very reason that Habakkuk was able to ask how long was because he was interceding. Because he intervened. And said, how long am I going to do this, God? How long am I going to do this? Because God answers us in Habakkuk 1 verse 5. He says, but be utterly astounded. For I will work a work in your days, which you would not believe, though it were told you. And we've got to get our faith out there. We've got to understand that Jesus Christ is coming for a victorious church. And you know what? That God has got a church within the church today. And when I'm saying a church within the church, I mean people within every denomination out there that are sincere with God. And somehow God is going to bring these people together to begin to intercede, to begin to pray on behalf of the church. And we've got to understand if we want revival, then it's got to be within us first. 
We cannot intercede on behalf of the community. We cannot intercede on behalf of the church unless we come to a point where we look at ourselves in the light of God's word and we identify the very wrongs, the very sin that is in our own life. And we correct that first. It always starts with, 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 with yourself. And if we first come and we correct that, then we're coming to a position where we can begin to intercede on behalf of others. And then you earn the right, like a Habakkuk, to say, how long? I've been doing it, God, how long am I still going to do it before you intervene? There's a prayer for revival. And through the ages, God's people have, have joined Habakkuk in prayer, asking for revival. If we have a look at it through church history and we see and we think of people like a John Wesley and a John Knox and we constantly think, even going back to a Martin Luther, as we constantly see that when the church comes into a position of depravity, when the church comes into a position of compromise, when the church comes into a position of no longer being the salt or the light, how God raises up men and women to begin to intercede on behalf. People with the courage of their conviction. The time has come for that to happen again in this world. People have asked, revive your works, Lord, in the midst of this time. That's what we've got to ask. Revive your works, Lord, in the midst of this time, in the midst of these circumstances, in the midst of this generation, in the midst of the lawlessness. You see, sometimes we lose our first love. Even as the church of Ephesus did in Revelation 2 verse 4. We lose our first love. Sometimes we come into a position where, our, where we're into churchianity. Sometimes we're into a position where we're into religion instead of relationship. Sometimes we're just into this habit of going to church and singing and raising our hands like little robots. There's no more passion. There's no more love in it. We've we, we got to understand that death creeps in. Death is not an overnight thing. And when we look out, death has crept into the modern church. Slowly. Over time. So many things that were once just accepted as the norm has gone out the window. There's no desire for people to reach the lost anymore. There is no desire for people to intercede on behalf of others anymore. And it's because that first love is gone. We have just become ritualistic. We're sitting and we're going to church every Sunday morning and we're just going through the motions. If you're going to see a revival, if you're going to see people of sincere hearts, you're going to find that people just do spontaneously. In the 70s, I had the privilege of experiencing this. And when I used to see that people just, every night of the week we gathered. Every night of the week, we just gathered at someone's house and just prayed together. Take out musical instruments and just praise God together. It wasn't the thing of, oh, I don't have time, I'll wait for Sunday. There was a genuine love of people that genuinely had a relationship with Jesus Christ and with one another. And they just, that was their lives. Everything else was second. And sometimes I think we just lose our first love. We just do what we have to do. We just do it like a habit. And there are various reasons for this. Sometimes difficulties arise, or time passes, or the very emphasis that we place on things may change, or key people move away, and almost without noticing it, the love, the life, the zeal, that we had for God just goes and vanishes. Sometimes we want to look and we want to see a church grow in great numbers and because it doesn't, we lose our fervor, we lose our zeal. And we must never be caught into that trap of the numbers game. The church will grow in numbers when we are sincere and we genuinely come to God. When we renew that relationship, that love for God. When we have a true, sincere zeal for God. 
Habakkuk's prayer for revival here contains at least 11 elements of prayer, which serve as a good example for us. And I've had them typed. You can have them after the service. But we need to come to a point where we decide that we want to actually serve God. We need to come to a point where it's no longer about my pride. It's no longer about my way. It's no longer about how I want it, but how God wants it. Our praise, our worship should be spontaneous. It should just happen. There should be a joy within us that says, I am saved. I'm not going to hell. There's a joy within me because I have a relationship with the living God. Instead, when you look at people today, it's like praise is a punishment. Praise is a punishment. The church has gone dead. The first love is gone. And the time has come that we pray this prayer of revival with Habakkuk. And the time has come that we start within our little circle, beginning with self. The time has come that we seriously question our relationship with God. The time has come where we seriously say, do I actually have a relationship with God or am I just into religion? Am I just going to church every Sunday morning to soothe my conscience? Because that's what we do as Christians. Or do we really want to be in church? Because why do we come to church? To fellowship with the saints. To hear the word of God being taught. And to praise and to worship God. We need to question this. We need to sincerely look within. Sorry that it sounds so personal, but it is so personal. God wants a relationship with each and every one of us. And if we've not come to that point, if God is not that real, then it is time that we reach out to Him and He becomes that real to us. If we do not have such a relationship, it is time that we get into a position that we do. So that we can cry out, so that we can intercede on behalf of the church, on behalf of this, the community we're living in. But we can never do it unless we deal with self first. We can never do it if we're just happy to come to church on Sunday. Really, He's the lover of my soul. He's the Lord of my life. You know, when you think of when you have a relationship, with your wife when it started or your when you have a relationship with someone of the opposite sex can you remember in the beginning that desire to be with the person that desire to talk to the person you wanted to spend all your time with that person we need that kind of relationship with jesus christ the kind of relationship where i cannot wait to get to church the kind of relationship where i cannot wait to get into prayer the kind of relationship where i cannot wait to praise and to worship him now, if we're busy with anything outside of that, then we're busy with religion. It's time to drop our inhibitions. It's time to drop our pride. Our church dogma, we need to leave it. This nation desperately needs people. To intercede on their behalf. Desperately. And as Christians, we must stop living in denial. We must see the writing that's on the wall and come before God. For we're in for a rough ride. I'm going to ask you this morning to stand with me. Father God, 
by your spirit, through your spirit. Speak, convince, convict people right now. Let us realize, Father, that we cannot play church, that we cannot be involved in religion, but we need a relationship with the living God. Let us not be into ritual and into habit, Father. Bring us to the point, Father, that our first love will be restored. This morning, open hearts and open minds. Holy Spirit, you can only speak. Only you can reveal the Father and the Son to individuals this morning. Enable us this morning to understand your love, your grace, your mercy for us. Enable us this morning to understand that you've placed us here with a purpose and that we're not fulfilling that purpose. Enable us to understand that we are Indeed, the light and the salt and the epistles of the Lord Jesus Christ. <coughs> we are, in fact, the only hope for this world. Let us understand that this morning, Father. Above all, I pray, Father, for relationships with you to be restored this morning. Touch hearts, even now. Oh Lord, I break this falseness. I break this inability to praise this religious spirit of false piety in the name of Jesus this morning. Let us become spontaneous like children in our relationship with you, in our praise and in our worship. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you will pass from seat to seat, from person to person, and you will speak from heart to heart so that we indeed can begin to intercede for our community, for our church. In Jesus' name, this morning, Father, let us shake off every shackle of piety. Let us shake off every shackle this morning, Father, of religion. Bring us to a point of relationship. Shed your love abroad in hearts this morning, Father. In Jesus' precious name. In Jesus' precious name. And I thank you for the King.